Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. <coughs> and this particular series is a very thoughtful, provocative, thinking series on Romans. Entitled Salvation by Faith Alone, the Book of Romans. And this particular lesson is lesson number seven in that series, entitled Overcoming Sin. It's the lesson for November 18 of 2017. We're going to have a lot of things to, to, to stir up our gray matter in this lesson, so let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we know that you were in full cooperation with Paul as he wrote these words to the people in Rome. We wish we knew a lot more about who it was that he was writing to, but we have to assume that they were pretty regular kind of people, kind of like us, we need to try to understand what these lessons mean to ordinary people. May that be our success today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. So Romans 6, which we'll be talking about today, starts out by talking about baptism. Let's just look at those verses very quickly. Romans 6, 1 to 4. What do we say then? Should we continue to live in sin so that God's grace will increase? Certainly not. We have died to sin, how then can we go on living in it? For surely you know that when we were baptized into union with Christ Jesus, we were baptized into union with his death. By our baptism, then, we were buried with him and share his death in order that just as Christ was raised from death by the glorious power of the Father, so we also might live a new life. Okay, so there's the pattern. You got it all figured out? Well, you know, as you look around and you, you consider the various churches that are promoting their various doctrines around now, you should start asking some questions. Can you bury someone by sprinkling a little dirt on their heads? Wouldn't work too well, right? So we're going to start off with a definition of baptism from one of the most respected uh, Greek lexicons. Or, or dictionaries. Baptism, it means to baptize, to wash. If you, if you wash your dishes, you're baptizing them in Greek. It meant to dip repeatedly, to immerse, to submerge of, of vessels which are sunk, to cleanse by dipping or submerging, to wash, to make clean with water, to wash oneself or bathe, to overwhelm. And then it goes into some very other kinds of meanings. But then the clearest example that shows the meaning of baptizo is a text from the Greek poet and physician Nicander, who lived about 200 BC. It is a recipe for making pickles. Now, did you know that pickles would teach us something about baptism? Well, it's a recipe for making pickles, and it's helpful because it uses both words. Uh, Nicander says that in order to make a pickle, the vegetable should first be dipped, bapto, Notice that it's bapto, into boiling water and then baptized, baptizo, in the vinegar solution. Both verbs concern the immersing of vegetables in a solution, but the first is temporary. The second, the act of baptizing the vegetables, produces a permanent change. Uh, do we usually think that pickles are a little different than cucumbers? When used in the New Testament, this word more often refers to our union identification with Christ than to our water baptism. For example, Mark 16, 16 says, He that believes and is baptized shall be, shall be saved. Christ is saying that mere intellectual assent <coughs> is not enough. There must be a union with him, a real change, like the vegetable to the pickle. So, um, what do we say to our Christian friends who say, a, a little dipping, maybe even a little sprinkling, uh, when you're born, that's all the baptism you need. So Ken, does, do you agree with that statement when used in the New Testament, this word more often refers to our union and identification with Christ than to our water baptism? And then they give the example of he, he believes, mm -hmm. he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Is, well, is that just a theoretical baptism or is it a physical baptism? Well, of course, that depends on your interpretation of a collection of verses exactly. that, that use that. And uh, they say, they assume that it's the, the you know, 
uh, but it, yeah, I think in, in, the, in the words of the original apostles, it probably meant real baptism, physical baptism. But um, this whole baptism thing, isn't it symbolic? Well, yeah, it's supposed to be symbolic. Well, then what is the big thing about making sure it's immersion or not? Because so what the whole thing is just a, a symbol. Well, because what's it, if, you, if I say, uh, let's see, we'll use um, a garden hose as a symbol for a car, you would say, huh? What? Exactly. <laughs> no, no, I'm just looking at your illustration. I'm saying, what? Well, that's the point. So if you, if you want to use an illustration that's a good symbol, it should, it should be obvious to people that there's a relationship. Yeah, well, but what's the, the big deal of, well, it's, of it, the symbol being high quality or not? If it, it's not a matter of quality, it's a symbol of something else. Uh, if you sprinkle <laughs> water on it, that's not uh, immersion. That's not... Uh, well, if because, it's, because it's symbolic of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. I know that, but you know, I heard some other thing that they started some of the sprinkling because of the plague. They didn't trust the water, and so they started they started mm -hmm. sprinkling because of that, especially in the cities. Well, and you it just became a tradition yeah. after that. Well, I, I can tell you that you don't need to argue with your Catholic friends as to how baptism was done in the early church. If you get the New Testament translated from the original Greek by two very prominent, very important Catholic scholars, James A. Kleist, mm -hmm. Society of Jesus, and Joseph Lilly, uh, and I'm not sure what his group is, the footnote for Romans 6.3 says, St. Paul alludes to the manner in which a bad baptism was ordinarily conferred in the primitive church by immersion. The descent into the water is suggestive of the descent of the body into the grave, and the ascent is suggestive of, suggestive of a resurrection to a new life. Suggestive. That means right. it's, it's, it's a symbol. symbolic. Exactly. Right. So, right. You, so want a, you want a symbol so that why symbolizes. Does a symbol, why is a symbol so important that we're making a big deal out of it? Well, because symbols are supposed to they're supposed to teach things. They they they're supposed to look like what you're do what you're what you're talking about. The symbolism they're supposed is to? lost. The symbolism was lost if you're just sprinkling. Yeah, but it's water. It's not dirt. Uh, but doesn't no. that kind of it's you know you're getting covered by dirt when you die. Doesn't that so if you're using water, you're not really using the dirt. You're just no. symbolizing. No. Yeah, uh, it's it's symbolizing, but it's it's referring to a particular So thing. why are we making big argument over okay, this? Okay, here's, here's what's being suggested. Go ahead. I was hmm. going to say, if you take it further, it kind of impinges on another area of our theology. What's the sense of flicking water, holy water, on little babies? They don't know what's going on. When you're adult, hopefully you do know what's going yeah. on. There's, there's a whole different way of looking at that. Yeah. Well, the experience of baptism is intended to be the outward public manifestation of a change that has already taken place in the life of the believer. It is no less of a change than dying, being buried, and then arising to a new life. This is the best symbol this is best symbolized by the act of being buried into the water and then being brought up again like a to live a new life in close connection with Jesus Christ. But we need to be honest about the great controversy. Such a change alerts the devil to go to work even harder to defeat the person's intentions. Things may not seem to go a lot worse, may seem to, go, to get a lot worse for those who declare themselves for Christ. So Paul goes on to say, in fact he just said just before this, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law but under grace, Romans 6.14. So if works can't save us, which is what we've been discussing, why bother with them at all? Why not just keep on sinning? Well, it depends what your definition of sin is. Yeah. So if my definition of sin is any decision you make without bringing the Lord into it, okay. and that could even be good things, you don't put, bring the Lord into it. If you take, if you take uh, Romans 14, 23, it suggests that anything that brings you closer to the Lord is faith, Things which take you away from the Lord is sin. So no that. that's, that's pretty straightforward, I think. 
Well, Paul goes on. The word sanctification appears only twice in Romans. It appears in Romans 6, 19 and 22 as the Greek word hagiosmos, which means sanctification. In English, it appears in these two texts as the word holiness, depending on, of course, which translation you're using. Does this mean that Paul has nothing to say about what commonly is understood by sanctification? No, not at all. In the Bible, to sanctify, strictly speaking, means to dedicate, usually to God, thus to be sanctified often is presented as a past completed act. For example, all them which are sanctified, Acts 20, verse 32. The sanctified ones in the definition are the ones who are dedicated to God, and in the, if you go back to the Old Testament, it really means something that is set aside for, for special purposes. So doesn't that mean you're a saint? Well, saint is a word that comes from sanctify. So, Okay, then, so why, <laughs> why don't we just use the word saint? Almost. Instead of that word that... Well, it's, a, it's a difference between... Set aside. It's the same word. But it's a, one word talks about the process and the other talks about the product. Product in this... Okay. Well, if all our sinning makes God look so good because He forgives, shouldn't we just continue to sin to make God look even better? What a ghastly thought. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what who was that? Yeah, 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 exactly. Why did he even why ask the devil's, devil's backyard? Well, that good was speed or well, good speed, you well, probably right. Why did Paul, he even ask that question? Well, I mean, if you're... There must have been a problem. Yeah. So what could it have been? Well, if you read Romans 6 fairly superficially, you might be inclined to, to think something like that. Well, think of some of the words we use in, in Christianity. Are we set right by faith? Are we saved by faith? Are we judged by works? Does faith work? What does it mean to be baptized into his death in Romans 6, 1 to 3? Are we somehow mystically transported to Calvary and Old Jerusalem and actually go through the dying process? Or is this a metaphor for a certain type of Christian experience? If we are baptized into union with Christ's death, is that saying that he is to be our example? And of course you, you all know, I don't need to tell any of you, that because this is a core idea to Christianity, there have been how many different metaphors, and we sometimes mix them all up and jumble them up, and, and people don't, aren't sure what we're saying by the time we're done. So can we do better than that t today? Shall we try? Why was Jesus baptized? He didn't need to be baptized. He said, to, he said, let it be done. Well, John the Baptist said, you know, I need to be baptized by you. You know, he mm -hmm. kind of resisted the whole idea. But Jesus <laughs> well, said, I need to, no, we need to do this in order to fulfill all righteousness. You, you, okay. said, you said it was symbol, symbolite. Mm -hmm. Baptism is a symbol. Yes. Well, it could almost look like Jesus was symbolizing his death and resurrection. Okay. So, in a way, um, it makes sense. Or was he being an example? Well, that too, but you, you can't deny the fact that the symbolic symbolism is there also. What, what, really, what really changes when a person is baptized? He's, Nothing. He goes, <laughs> he goes down dry, comes up wet. Nothing changes at that point. As a matter of fact, we know from the Acts of the Apostles that on several occasions the change was already done before they were baptized. So there has to be a disposition of heart that accepts a new way to think, which is instead of being self-centered, a person chooses to become other-centered as Jesus was. Mm -hmm. So now let's think about this for a moment. What do we know, let's do a little speculating. This is, we understand this is a little bit of speculation. What do we know about the church in Rome that Paul was writing to? We have quite a list of people that he said hello to. In <laughs> so Romans 16, that's correct. Some, were, some of whom he knew before, mm -hmm. obviously. Some were Jews. Quite, quite a lot of them he must have run into somewhere. Since he hadn't been to Rome mm -hmm. before, all of these people he's saying hello to, must, he must have encountered somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. And they were known for their faith. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, and how did that happen? There's no evidence that any of the apostles went there that we know of. Where did all that, where did that church, how did that church get started? Where did they get their faith? Well, a lot of people must have gone there. Priscilla and Aquila went there and a uh, whole list of others, which if you read the last chapter. Um, so you're saying that uh, uh, this is a church, a major church in the largest city in the empire was, I, using a, a modern expression, owned and operated by a bunch of lay, lay people? Well, isn't that how all the churches were? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, why know, would, would we call Paul a lay person? Why, but why couldn't we? It's happening it's today, yeah, and Rome was more boring. or less the center of the then yeah. known mercantile world. Their roads were arteries all over the place. Somebody had to go through there and do it. They apparently were doing a good job, yeah. whoever they were. But Paul even credits whoever it was with yeah. having brought them a very good faith, a very good yeah. understanding of Scripture. Okay, in this, in this chapter, there's a lot of talk about being under the law. What does it mean to be under law? And by contrast, I say, suppose fairly, we need to say, what does it mean to be under grace? Under the law would be under condemnation of the law or uh, attempt to, um, to do the law. In okay. other words, we, we use the law as our guide of what to do as opposed to Christ. Here's what might be a modern example. If you're caught speeding on the freeway and have to go to court and stand before a judge, there's a possibility the judge might say, since this is your first offense, very first offense, I'm, I will let you go. But if it happens again, I will throw the book at you. Such a driver is then, driver is then described as operating under grace, right? Yeah. Prior to the infraction, was he under the law? So which would you rather be, under law or under grace? He lucked <laughs> out. He got it both ways. <laughs> uh, yeah. How many times can we be forgiven? By God or by other people? Well, I guess. Now, and so that's, and, a, that's a really, that's a really good point. The question is if God, if Jesus says uh, 70 times 7, which is more of not so much an exact number as a, as symbolic, uh, yeah. would we say that God is any less forgiving than he asks us to be? Absolutely not. I mean, the, God, God is forgiveness personified. He's and worried. so our problem is not forgiveness. We are not in, in need of forgiveness. Nobody is, needs to be forgiven because everybody is forgiven. They're so, not lacking in forgiveness. Sometimes okay. people, though, have trouble forgiving themselves. For, That's also for, true. So, so having a, a divine forgiveness uh, sometimes yeah. can lead well, he, to healing because they'll say, I can't forgive myself, how can God forgive me? You know, the, the example that we need to go to probably since this lesson is a focusing on Martin Luther, Martin Luther was obsessed with his former so-called sinful life and the guilt that was connected with it and he wanted to be forgiven and as far as he was concerned the whole secret to salvation was to be forgiven which is his definition of justification. So, in other words, he saw God as a, a fearsome God up there, and he said, God, could you forgive me? Could you think, could you somehow bring it to your, bring your, yourself to forgive me? And if you forgive me, then if God is not fearsome anymore, if he's, if he's forgiven me, then he can't keep me out of heaven. That was a sort of understanding of the plan of salvation. Is, is that the way it is? No. Most of Christianity subscribes to that point of view. Yeah, and, and in fact, the translation, Bible translations have been where they uh, should be using the word um, what am I, remission of sins. They put in the word forgiveness of sins, totally paradigms away. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we we say we've already had some lessons about this that justification, if we use that, we want to use that long Latin word is the work of a moment. It can happen and, and maybe it happens repeatedly in our lives. What about sanctification? How long does that take? Forever. Forever. Whoa. Lifetime, I should say. Okay. 
Well, Ellen White made these comments in Christ's Topic Lessons, page 65, paragraph 2. At every stage of development, our life may be perfect. Yet if, if God's purpose is to be fulfilled, for us is fulfilled, there will be continual advancement. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. As our opportunities multiply, our experience will, will enlarge and our knowledge increase. So, we shouldn't even worry about getting perfect in this life, right? It's just, you just keep going. Is that the way it is? Well, we should endure. Yes, we should work on endures that. Mm -hmm. to the end. We should abide in Christ. Those are the uh, the things that uh, will produce perfection. If we don't believe it's possible, then of course we won't even yeah. consider it. But uh, so you, if there's a sense in which you have to think of it as possible, uh, even to to um, abide in. You, you know, know otherwise perfect. you cling to forgiveness. Perfect um, has several definitions. I yep. mean, like your perfect tomato thing example. You could have several perfect tomatoes, but they're all different shapes. They're all different sizes. Mm -hmm. Or you can have mathematical per perfect perfection, which is can't be done. <laughs> so... Well, let me read a paragraph that I remember very distinctly people talking about when I was a kid. The righteousness by which we are justified is imputed, and the righteousness by which we are sanctified is imparted. The first is our title to heaven, the second is our fitness for heaven. And my head by that time was just sort of going around in circles like this, what in the world is that talking about? So now you're all going to help me right now and tell me, get, make it very clear, right? Well, I should say, the next paragraph, which I never heard anybody discuss, says, Many commit the error of trying to define minutely the fine points of distinction between justification and sanctification. Into the definition of these two terms, they often bring their own ideas and speculations. Why try to be more minute than is inspiration on the vital question of righteousness by faith? Now, that's found in several places. Uh, was originally in a manuscript in 19, 1891, written by Alan White, then it's, in more modern times, it's found in the S.T.A. Bible Commentary, 1072, paragraph 4, and The Faith I Live By, 116, verses 1 and 2. Well, that's interesting, <clears throat> because if, you're, if you don't cover the minutia, are you, are you really perfect? Well, I mean, that, I guess, would be the question. So what does imputed mean as opposed to imparted? Well, she warns us about getting too minute about the differences because it's, it, I think she's saying they're, they're a package. Uh, you, you really can't have, I'm, I'm suggesting that maybe we can't have one without the other. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, trying to focus too much on one versus the other we, is where we get into all of these word wars mm -hmm. over over things. I will tell you that in high school, I remember hearing sanctification and justification. It was, who cares? You know, it was an attitude of, you know, I can't figure it out, so why bother? Yeah. But if you use the example of baptism, I remember being baptized very well and coming up out of the water going, I don't feel any different than I did before I went down in the water. But if you take what Mrs. White says in sanctification taking the work of a lifetime, you deal with this and you build on that to the next thing and the next thing. It's not the minutia, it's building and continually getting closer and closer to a relationship with God that mm -hmm. can't be torn apart. Okay, do we have, this is the question, do we have any part in either justification or sanctification? You make decisions. Yeah. That's okay. what it boils down to. You, you make we, a choice. Exactly. We respond to the light. We can mm -hmm. resist uh, we and accept. be lost, or we can respond to the light and be saved. And as well, we continue to respond, <clears throat> we will grow. I, it, it was just like my coming up out of the water thinking, okay, I'm going to be changed. I made the choice to be baptized, and then I figured, well, 
you know, then it's just going to happen. Yeah. I didn't have to make any more choices because I'd made that big choice. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, you have to make choices all day long, every yeah. day. That's why you're so tired at night. <laughs> Could you say there's a difference between giving and absorbing? Mm -hmm. Sanctification, you're absorbing, you, you're, you're growing in it, and then you get the other. Mm -hmm. God says, this one will pass master, let them through. What well, about, uh, how, much, how much can you assist God in whatever work he's doing? Well, let me, let me go on here. Another place on why it says sanctification is the work of a lifetime, then she goes on to say, the true Christian must be unresting in his endeavors. He is ever climbing, never content with that to which he has attained. The more he seeks a knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, whom he has sent, the more he desires to reflect the divine image. Every gift imparted to him by God is used to draw others in the same line, to hunger and thirst after righteousness, to hunger and thirst after righteousness. The longer he walks in the path of self-denial and self-sacrifice, the more willing he is to hide himself in Christ and sacrifice all for him. Well, you kind of need to assist all you can. It may turn out okay, to not be very much. How do you assist? Well, just, okay, I want to help this person down the road here. I don't have any money. I don't yeah. have anything. So I pray. And then you get up and you look. You, you What can I do to, to help, mm. to assist? You might go over there and not find anything, but at least you went over there. So sometimes, you know, the assisting may not yield very much, but sometimes it might. You just don't know. I, I, I have a very simplistic, maybe it's too simplistic, approach to that and, and, and my understanding. I think the Holy Spirit is the only one who can change us. I don't think there's any other way to be changed, but we have to give him the opportunity. That means we open our Bible, we pray, we do various kinds of activities that says, okay, now I'm in tune with heaven, go to work. And, but if we don't give him an opportunity, if we're busy with our minds focusing on every other thing in the world, and we'd rather watch the movies and read our Bible or something like that, then the Holy Spirit says, how am I supposed to get any work done here? There's, never, there's no time. Or if we harden our hearts against that person. Sure then we're not responding to the Holy Spirit. So we have to allow the Holy Spirit to change us and give him permission to change us. If the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Truth and uh, the Comforter is, is, is Jesus, uh, and a lot of, the question is how do we respond to truth? Mm -hmm. And Jesus, uh, as the Comforter, gives us uh, truth. And he can't force feed it on us, he can't do any magic to us, to, to th think uh, the right way. He, all he can do is provide information and, and uh, by which then we can either make a choice for or against. Yeah. It's really simple, but this mysticism of somebody coming in and, and uh, tweaking our brain and doing something that is foreign to, to the way he runs the universe, I, I, I think we, we need to reevaluate our uh, how, understanding of that. How do you know <coughs> when you, how does God know or the angels know when you've given permission to for God well, to, to, to do his work in us? And I, I, I think, again, I take a fairly simplistic attitude to that. If you're reading your Bible and you're trying to learn from it, you're, you're taking that seriously, you're giving God an opportunity. Well, you're doing an effort there. You're trying to learn. Yeah, sure. So, well, so there's, there, if there's a way to, you can't just say, yes, Lord, do it. I mean, it, yeah, no, to me, to me, it would be more advantageous to try. Well, and then when you try and you fail, well, you're you're kind of letting them know that you need help, and you're letting yourself know you need help. But I, I mean, I if you don't, if you don't try to keep the law, yeah. you won't you you won't find out that you can't keep it. If you don't admire the law, you won't even have any interest in in trying. Sure. Remember Jesus in John seventeen three. And what are we doing all this stuff about sanctification? It, it, the, it, we're looking for eternal life to, at some level, right? And uh, John 17, 3, eternal life is to know the Father and the Son, or the Father and the Son that, uh, that Jesus, or the Father sent. And John 6, 
uh, if you eat my flesh, drink my blood, I'll raise you in the last day. What's, how could it be any more simple than that? Well, what, it mean, what does it mean to eat my uh, flesh and eat my blood? Eat, <laughs> drink my blood. It means to absorb every, my understanding is it means to absorb everything you possibly oh. can about God. Mm -hmm. It's a law of human nature. You become like the person or thing that you worship or admire. And if you have a false god, the is it is it possible? Which <clears throat> is, let me let me ask a couple more questions. Which is harder to do, faith or works? They both well, can be pretty difficult. <laughs> you know, uh, if, if I drive down the highway, I exercise a fair amount of faith uh -huh. because I'm pretty pretty sure that the guy's not going to want to wipe himself out, and, and the odds are. Uh, <laughs> that something's not going to uh, mm -hmm. wipe my out, wipe me out. So, but I think we exercise more faith that way with with fellow man than we do with with God. Many times, could we actually reach the place if we focused enough on on God and, and allowed the Holy Spirit to work in us? Could we reach a place where we no longer want to sin? Why, That's the whole so idea, wonderful. isn't it? That's the whole idea. Well, I don't wow. want to sin right now, but I'm still doing it. <laughs> so, and, and the, the question we're going to ask next, of course, is why? Right. That's, that's, that's next week's lesson, so we better <laughs> save that discussion for next week. But, you know, I like C.S. Lewis's um, explanation for faith and work. They're, they're like two blades of the scissors. Uh -huh. You've got to have one to make the other work, and uh -huh. so they cut the paper. Yeah. I thought that was pretty good, but... Still well, have to how many Christians it. are in a continual <laughs> cycle of sinning, repenting, being forgiven, and sinning again? <clears throat> is that an indication of failure, or could that? Is there any way that could be called a victory? Well, to get to the top of the mountain, you have to keep on going. It's not mm -hmm. about how many times you trip and fall on the way up; it's whether you get up and keep going. As it. Mm -hmm. It says in Proverbs 24, 16, a righteous man falls seven times, but rises again. Mm -hmm. Only seven? I well, that's to what it today. says. It's a perfect number. Yeah. Okay. And at the VA, they have sayings in the stairwell on each of the floors in these big pictures. And the one that caught me today was the New England Patriots. Um, quarterback? Or, or what? I don't remember whether it was the quarterback or the owner said, if you fall for if you fall on your face, you're still going forward. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, well, you know, there's some truth to that. <laughs> That's good. Yards. You're yeah. gonna yeah. in the ground with your nose. <laughs> okay, now, and, and, and let's let's let me try this one on you. Would you consider the sins of saints too great or just too many? I know I'm asking some crazy questions here, but. There really is only one sin, uh -huh. and the one sin is lack of love. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, oftentimes we see this word in the plural when in reality it's in the singular. Uh -huh. Why? Because we tend to look at everything from a judicial point of view, and we attrib attribute to the word justification or justified a legal definition, yeah. which it is not. Because in God's mind, it's all about becoming increasingly more just. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the early Christians who were listening to Paul speak were hearing it the way he intended the word to be understood, mm -hmm. not from a legal point of view, but from Christ's point of view. Mm -hmm. Keep growing and become increasingly more just throughout your life. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Increasingly more loving. Yeah. And righteous. Another word would be righteous. Righteousness is becoming more lo loving. Yeah. Well, I don't think any of us would question the fact that Christ lived a, a perfect life from beginning to end. It's amazing when you, the more you study it, it just, it, it just blows me away that he, I mean, his youth, his, you read the couple chapters in Desire of Ages about what he went through as, as a young man. It was amazing. Uh, so Christ has defeated sin. Does that, can we somehow uh, say, okay, Christ, come into my life, put your life in place of mine, and then I don't have to worry about anything anymore? God can't do that. No. 
You're created uh, with an indiv individual uh, with the capacity to think and to do, and he's not going to violate the way things work. He's, it's like gravity. Can't mm -hmm. do it mm -hmm. because he's love. He's not a manipulator, not a controller, not a penalty payer. It's, he's a teacher. He mm -hmm. came as a teacher, not as a penalty payer. It's a, it's a good idea, though, to keep your eye on him. That's all. It's a law of human nature. You become like the person or thing that you worship and admire, of course. But he's, can't, he can't mess, up with, with your, mess around with your he, brain. Well, not that he can't. He won't. If he's love, by definition. Well, okay. Yeah, if you put that condition. Uh, it's, 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 I have to put it in there. I mean, yeah. it's... it's uh, <clears throat> well, if we are no longer dominated by sin, because Christians aren't supposed to be dominated by sin, are we still controlled by it? I'm sorry. <laughs> it, it all depends what becomes most important to us in our yeah. lives. If it is love, we are going to grow towards a more, a, ever more loving life. And it's beautiful to see a Christian who understands that principle. And you see them grow into that love throughout their life. I've seen that in several people in my life, and it is a beautiful thing to... What happened with Paul? Yeah. Eh? The, 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 a radical transformation. Yeah. Least not overnight. Uh, no, yeah. it was a... I'm not sure I see a difference between dominated and controlled. Mm -hmm. uh, we. It, once we are freed from sin, we're not controlled. We might stumble and fall in a moment of mm -hmm. weakness, but it's not the occasion, as Ellen White says, not the occasional deed or misdeed, but the, mm -hmm. uh, the trend, trend of the life. Trend of the life. Yeah. Part of the fruit of the spirit is encratia, mm -hmm. self-control. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, why do we th think? Well, let go and let God, God come in, and, and, and then, and then. If you do bad, that well, I gave God control. I want a cop out. Yeah. See, <coughs> I, I think we need to be careful when we, when we, consider Paul's word when he says we are not under the law. We are all born under the law, under the law of nature that makes us self-centered, selfish, and that's the law under which every single one of us is born, including Jesus. By the way, yeah, we. Ha, we all have that tendency in us ever since Adam and Eve because there's a lack of trust in one another and a lack of trust in God. So automatically we become uh, very reticent to share with others because we can't trust them. As a result, we lack love. Christ taught us that you never second question anybody. Not even those who put him on the cross and put nails in his hands. Mm -hmm. He loved them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in this chapter, we get, we get some very interesting expressions. What does it mean to be alive to sin or alive to God? And of course, the contrast is to being dead to sin or being dead to God. Um, Responsive to. Are, am I responsive to sin? If I'm, if I mean, you can kick a dead body and you, mm -hmm. you get no response. Or if you find somebody who's passed out, you know, you you do the the uh, shake and shout. That's the first thing in CPR. Yeah. You know, are they responsive? If they're not, but there's there's some still some life, then you go on down the line. But uh, I think. That might be one way of looking at it. Uh, are they res are we responsive to God or are we dead to God? Can we? Can you actually be the opposite? Can you be alive to sin and dead to God? Yes. Yeah. Well, Paul seems to think so. He uses those terms. That's how we start out in life. By your repeated choices, you can be that way. It's interesting to be alive to one or alive to the other, dead to one or dead to the other. Mm -hmm. There's kind of a symbolism there. Yeah, I've kind of ran across it in the Bible several if, places. If we respond to Christ, as you're suggesting, and I would suggest, and we're not responding to sin, are we becoming actually healthier, happier, and holier? If responding to Christ implies applying the love of Christ, the faith of Jesus mm -hmm. in our lives, which is all about loving others, how can we stop growing in our so-called righteousness, which is yeah. growth of love. Should people be able to see that in us? 
I think we should. They should. What does it say in Matthew five sixteen? Find us all. In the same way, your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. So apparently, it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be visible, ultimately. And they ascribe it to your Father in heaven. Yes. And that's a good a good trick. Figure out how to do that. Um, okay. Well, we all know about bad habits. How do we get bad habits? Repetition. Bad choices. Repetitive bad choices. Could a person actually be falling deeper and deeper into sin and still be a Christian? I've read several quotations recently about people who are doing that, and uh, Ellen White says they're the most dangerous kind because they, they misrepresent the church, they lead other people to think, well, this person's a Christian, look what he's doing, and then they think it's all right for them to do it. You mean they're Christian by name? Yeah, only? well. Well, it, you know, That's if, if they were, me. <laughs> let, let's say somebody is a Christian and then they start going the wrong way. Does God leave them immediately or is there a certain point at which we sin away the Holy Spirit? So some somebody might be falling deeper and deeper and still yeah. be a Christian, but if they persist, they will sin away the Holy Spirit. Is that, are you sure that's possible? What? To sin away the Holy Spirit? No, to be a Christian and go the other way. Um, go deeper and deeper in sin. Well, Isn't back, to my, back to my original statement you know if as soon as we we uh, sin are we immediately cut off are we on again no. off again on again off again like uh, some no, it's portrayed. a good thing because I'd be in trouble <laughs> so I, I'm just saying that at some point you you might start in that direction and sin and then you might do it again and then you you know and, and so what? somewhere up in this range you could still be a Christian but you're you're beginning to lose your grasp on on how, Christ. How do you how do you feel when you see a uh, and this just to be a little more common? I haven't seen it so much just recently. A bumper sticker which says, "I'm not perfect, just forgiven." Seems like they're being obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's some truth there, to it. Absolutely, yeah. there is truth to it. There's truth to it. It might be a little bit, but. We have to be careful not to jump to the conclusion that being forgiven means I'm saved. And this yeah. was Luther's problem. Yeah, exactly. It, precisely. Because as Jim has pointed out repeatedly, God is forgiveness personified. There is no problem on God's side with forgiving people. So forgiveness is not... The, and of course, Luther and others like him have developed that problem because they think God is the one who's going to punish the wicked in hell. So you want to be sure you're forgiven so that he doesn't send you to hell. Well, the whole thing is wrong. Right. Well, here's another place that Ellen White talks about the approach we should take. This is Steps to Christ, page 47. What you need to understand is the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision or of choice. Everything depends on the right action of the will. The power of choice, God has given to men, it is theirs to exercise. You cannot change your heart, you cannot of yourself give to God its affections, but you can choose to serve Him. You can give Him your will, He will then work in you, remember what I said earlier, to will and to do according to His good pleasure. Thus your whole nature will be brought under the control of the Spirit of Christ. Your affections will be centered upon Him, your thoughts will be in harmony with Him, Steps to Christ, 47. What does it mean to, to surrender your will? Well, that means I to say, understand. okay, God, each time I make a choice, I want it to be according to your will. Which is what? And I think we need to, the will of God is always that we be, that we be more loving. Yeah. So we always have a choice in life. We can either be more loving or less <laughs> loving. Well, I'm not talking about love, I'm talking about the will. But the will is dependent on our understanding of that love, and if we do everything as Christ does, we would always go towards love. You know? Well, what's happening with the will? 
I mean, we're, we're concentrating on the will here. You're, you're talking about the end product, which is no. love, but what no. exactly is No, it's happening? the other way around. Love has to come in so we can have the will to do what is loving. So will can force itself in there no, and make the will. not the will. Do the love. No, the love controls our will, not the will controls our love. How do you get, how do you get love to come in if your will this is not going towards love in the first place? Truth. Understanding of what love is, number one. If we understand what it is, and Christ gave us a definition, love your enemies. That's my question. Okay. I'm asking, what, what is it? Yeah. Well, what will, is it? Will is, will is your ability to make choices. The will is your ability to make choices. Yes. Governing power in the nature of it's man. A, is, yeah, it's a, it's red. Is it good? Okay, but um, the guy that doesn't want to drink anymore. I'm having the will not to drink anymore, but for some reason, so that means, it's come back. That leads to me my very next question. Is sin like an addiction? Yes. If you do it, do you want to do it more? Well, yes. you said it starts out. Right. If, if, if you're drinking, not being th selfish. If you, you started out being selfish, so how did. can it be addictive when you're already selfish? Right. And that's why we oh. need the love to recognize that the more we drink, the less we are loving to others because we are distressed. We are destroying what we are, number one, which means we can no longer serve them and serve and, and be loving towards them. So love has to come first, and then the will follows through. Well, we have to have, have a choice. If you just held out an apple and said choose, you know, but if you have an apple and an orange, then you can choose. So if you have evil on the one hand, that's how we're born. Unless God came and revealed himself, we would not have the choice to love and to know God. Um, you wouldn't mother, even know what love is. Yeah, My mother and my father taught me, and I'm sure most of you had the same experience, that there's an evil angel on one side and there's a good angel on the other side, and the good one is trying Your to convince shoulders? you. Yeah, good one is trying one's to convince you. One's talking in there. <laughs> I, 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 I guess so. <laughs> one was trying to get you to do what's right, and the other one's trying to get you to do what's wrong. <laughs> and you have to make the choice. God will, that's the point. The one thing God will not do for you is he will, make, he will not make the choice for you. You have to be the one to choose. Amen. Well, well lots of times people make the choice and they just can't carry through. Well, and that, that's, a, that's another issue. And that's not what we're talking about right now. But well, it's we're a, talking that's about the will, so that's part yeah. of it there. Next well, lesson. <laughs> look, at the, look at the world around us. Would you estimate that sin is decreasing or increasing? Corruption, greed, sexual scandal, drug abuse, etc. I mean, I almost hate There's to turn. There's more people, so I guess in a yeah. way it's increased. Well, I don't know. I think it's. I, I think it's the same. Well, I, I think there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah. I'm just saying there's more people that are doing it, so it well, seems. Well, I don't have any leaders that will. If I look at them wrong, they're going to kill me. I mean, that's what happened back in the olden days. I mean, well, in the ancient days. We still have a few. And there's. Yeah. Yeah, there's a few, but but look at Abraham. He he lied because he was scared the king was just going to take his wife and kill him. I mean, you don't have that kind of stuff happening now. Oh yes, yeah, you do. You got to look at the paper. Okay, the I can find a couple maybe in some well, other country. I, I tell you, but I, I'm not saying I'm not. I you asked, is it increasing? I'm just yes. saying it's about the same. It's increasing. Well, no. I, I get up in the morning, I go running for about an hour, I come back, I cleaned up, and I go downstairs, it's time for breakfast, and I turn on the news. And I swear, you've probably all heard this expression, if it bleeds, it leads. Somehow or other, newspaper and, and news organizations and TV and so forth think that the first thing you have to hear every morning is somebody got killed. Well, who's going to... Or, or, or gonna, killed in an auto accident. Or who's killed going to buy the paper if you're just going to talk about nice things all the time? I would. You would? <laughs> I would absolutely. Well, does everybody have to be like you? <laughs> no. I, <laughs> well, but, I mean, why do we have, to, be like why do we have to hear sure. about killing every day, every day? I mean, once in a while, would it be nice to have a change? Okay, so some people that got killed, we're just going to not talk about them and pretend like it didn't happen. You know, we, we hear a lot of politicians these days who say there are fewer m murders now than there were. 
But the fact is there are more shootings, just fewer people die because we have much better science, much better medicine, much yep. better ways of taking care of them immediately after the shooting. Does that mean that we are getting better because there are fewer people who die, when in reality there are more people getting <laughs> shot? The hatred is increasing. Yeah, yeah okay. it's increasing. Well, okay, now let's, we're coming down <coughs> toward the end of Romans 6, or well, we're only halfway through it, I guess. Romans 6, 12 to 14 focuses on these words, Sin must not be your master, for you do not live under law, but under God's grace. We have suggested that the law is like a mirror. It tells us when there's something wrong or, you know, with our appearance. A mirror does. If your face is dirty, does it help to break the mirror? Obviously not. This text has been used repeatedly down through the years against Seventh-day Adventists who say that we should still observe who Adventists say we should still observe all the Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath Commandment. If the law is what defines sin, then doing away with the law would eliminate sin, right? Well, in trying to understand Romans 6.14, it is useful to compare Romans 10.4, which says, For Christ means the end of the struggle for righteousness by the law for everyone who believes in him. I love that translation, or it's actually a paraphrase. What does that mean? Doesn't it mean that we should give up all pretense at earning salvation by keeping the law? Does it mean that we need to learn to depend more fully on Jesus Christ, not only for his grace, but also to change our lives? Doesn't he have the power to do that if we give him permission? Mm. He gives us information he, yeah. by, by example and... Uh, and words. Remember, he yeah. says that the words I have spoken will be your judge. Yeah. And his and uh, John six sixty three, uh, the words he has spoken is spirit and life. Huh? It's 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 so simple, but it's God is not uh, a lording over people. He doesn't uh, manipulate. He doesn't. He's our protector. And there's a lot of stuff we need protection from. Mm -hmm. But if we choose to leave his sphere of protection, mm -hmm. he will ultimately let us go. There are three verses that have been used against Seventh-day Adventists many, many times for years. I'm going to read each of them from the King James and maybe get an idea why they've been used against us. Romans 6, 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. You put that together with Romans 10, 4, which says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Then you put that together with Colossians 2, 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Doesn't that take care of things? I think maybe today we understand better being above the law than being <laughs> below the law. Yeah. And if you look at it that way, it kind of goes, okay, I know what it means to be above the law, and I don't want to be accused of being above the law. I think we need to define what the law is. Mm -hmm. Is it a proscription or is it a description? Is it a prescription or is it a proscription? And if we don't do that, we're, we're just, yeah. we, we, first of all, law, we think of courts and law books and codes and all that sort of stuff. Spoken it's like a true lawyer. False uh, pre uh, presupposition. I'm not a lawyer, but uh, <laughs> I've learned a few things. Well, law is, de just an example, think about these words. Law is demanding, exacting, exposing, accusing, unforgiving, <laughs> provoking, irritating, unyielding, impersonal, and it leads to rebellion. Grace, by contrast, is giving, forgiving, covering, persuading, very personal, and it wins us to repentance as faith. Well, in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 49, first paragraph, Ellen White says, God placed man under law as an indispensable condition of his very existence. He was a subject of the divine government, and there can be no government without law. So does that mean when it's all done and said, we'll be back under law? No, well, is it? it will be natural. Yeah. Once we acquire that perfect love we keep talking about, mm -hmm. we won't even have to think about what the law is. It will be so natural we won't need the law. Of course, our, 
our Christian friends who want to focus about, they want to set aside the law, and we know what they really want. They don't have anything against nine of the commandments. They want to get rid of that, what we call the fourth commandment, or the Sabbath commandment. So, uh, if it is true that by beholding we become changed, how is that supposed to work in our day-by-day -day experience? Do we find time every day to contemplate the life of Christ? If to the best of our ability we attempt to study the life of Christ, to think about his life, and to find ways to copy that, that life in our own lives, is that what is expected of us? But so often in our attempts to do what is right, we find our plans derailed by the devil. Is the devil made me do it, the story of the lives of many Christians? And does the devil have the ability to force us to sin? Now he will try. Does he have the ability to force us to sin? No. No, no he doesn't actually. Adam and Eve, they weren't forced to sin. No. They were enticed. They chose. Exactly. Paul, Paul wanted us to understand in this chapter that there are clearly two choices. We can either serve Satan and sin resulting in death, or we can serve God through obedience resulting in righteousness and eternal life. But so many Christian lives seem to wobble back and forth. You can't stand on the fence with one foot on each side. But that's what a lot of people want to try to do. Not going to work. If you don't want his goods, you don't go into his shop. <laughs> do we really want to be the slaves of the devil? It's very significant to notice in this passage that obedience is related to correct doctrine or teaching. How does knowing the truth about God and his will for us through a study of scripture help us to live the right kind of lives? And I come back to one of Jim's favorite verses. This is life eternal to know God and Jesus Christ whom he sent, right? To know God, that's what we need to do. We need to form good habits. How do we form good habits? By copying as far as possible the life of Jesus Christ. We need to look at it, we need to think about it, we need to dwell on it. Paul did it so much he was able to say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Would we dare to say that today? <laughs> it depends. Well, we need to conquer sin every day. We need to claim the help of Christ and the Holy Spirit. We need to fill our minds with the best possible things, Philippians 4 eight, and crowd out the devil of his ideas and his ideas. Sin cannot be stamped out. It must be crowded out. So, what are you filling your mind with? Are you filling with all of the right things so the devil can't find any room? Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to study about you, to think about you. May our minds be so full of the truth and the knowledge of you that there's no room for the devil, is our prayer in Jesus' name.